Well, since, uh, since we have about 20 people here, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, why don't we start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to get together and, and open up your word. And, uh, and just learn from you and, and um, learn about you, but also apply it to our lives, Lord. Um, be with us in this study tonight. We love you so much. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm just kidding. I'm, there's five people here. Sorry. All right. Uh, so Genesis chapter 9 is where we're going to be tonight. And, uh, and we'll break it up just um, in uh, a couple chunks here. But... A lot to cover in this. Genesis chapter 9, we'll start with the verse 7 verses here. So um, just quick background. This is um, immediately after the chapter, the flood has happened. God spared Noah and his family, uh, told Noah to build an ark. He did. They've been on this boat for over a year. We discovered that last time we met uh, before they actually got off the boat. Noah's first thing that he did was offer... A sacrifice of offering and worship to the Lord of thanks um, uh, for for keeping them safe and so now we are still seeing the aftermath of Noah after the flood is gone and now they've left the ark so that's where this happens in Genesis chapter 9 so verse 1 says and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, and multiply in it. So we're going to pause there for just a second. There's a lot going on in these verses. So we, we, so we see early on God is repeating his initial blessing from Genesis 1.28 of being fruitful and multiplying. So God is, uh, uh, the phrase even that they used in Genesis chapter 1 was that God blessed mankind and that's the blessing that he gave. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And God had said that to the animals and to mankind. Um, but there's some differences now moving forward. So that part is the same, but now there's some differences in his blessing in the next part of what he's saying here. So, um, in the original, in Genesis chapter one, God had said, you shall rule over the animals. You shall have dominion over the animals. The difference here is that they are, the animals will be in fear of you and they will dread you. Um, so that's a different, that's a different phrase than what had originally been said under the perfection part of it. But, you know, this is now after the fall of mankind. And so uh, it's basically saying all the animals are going to be in fear of man. So why say that? And, and what, what does that mean? You know, what about animals that end up attacking mankind? Uh, that's actually something in, in that they've studied, that when an animal fears something, they defend themselves and will attack. So, um, so even animals that attack are probably in fear of, of mankind. So uh, another difference is that before, with Adam and Eve, they were given to be vegetarians. He said, here's every, you can eat of everything in the garden. There was nothing about eating uh, meat, nothing about eating animals, but in this one, God is granting for them to eat meat. So for all you steak lovers, you're, it's allowed. So there you go. Um, so now, so that's another difference. He's saying, before I gave you the, uh, the green plants, now I give you everything. Um, and so God is allowing that, 
but he also gives some instructions to go along with being able to eat animals. So he says, if you're going to eat animals, uh, there's some specific instructions here. And he says, you shall not basically consume the blood is what he's saying. He's saying, I don't want you to consume the blood. And he equates the blood with the life of the animal. And, and he's, and he's, that is actually going to be used throughout the rest of the Bible. That phrase that's originally found here. Um, and, and the whole reason that Jesus is going to have to shed his blood, his blood will be the covering for our sin. And it's, and it's all of these verses are going to be re referencing this passage. So even in the new Testament, Jesus references this, uh, for his own sacrifice. Um, so he's saying you, you can't consume that that represents their life. And I don't want you doing that. Um, verse five then starts addressing basically homicide or, or murder. Uh, it's basically saying violence by man and animals is what prompted God to send the flood in the first place. So now how will God prevent, how is God what is God's solution for preventing violence in the future? And God gives an answer. He says, first, there will be a reckoning. In other words, God will require the lifeblood of those who took the lifeblood of someone else. Um, so what's interesting, this word reckoning has no uh, Hebrew word. So when I was, so I was looking that up, what, is, what do they mean by reckoning? So I just kind of looked up in other versions of the Bible and actually you might have a different version. What does yours say there? This is NASB and it says, surely I will require your lifeblood. Okay. So require, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it ties to just your life. Yep. And that word reckoning is tied to a life for a life, yeah. which they're going to get into in Exodus um, later, a uh, principle there. So, um, so this means any animal or person that takes a human life will be held accountable by God working through human representatives. So this is a statement by God that human life is highly valued. Um, so high in fact that it is protected by this system of punishment because God made man in his own image. So the implication of this is that to murder another human being, which is made in God's image, is to murder what is most like God on this planet and therefore is an attack on God himself. So really uh, what God is issuing here, he's saying that mankind has a very high value. Why? Because you're still made in the image of God. And because you're made in the image of God, you have high value not just to me, but you should have high value to each other. So obviously there must be a lot of care and um, caution taken in carrying out that process, especially in our systems today. Um, I think especially back then, um, you know, God is giving this to eight people on the planet. Uh, and so if one of them murdered someone else, they would all probably know who did it. You know, like it's, uh, it, it's hard to blame a whole lot of people at that point. So, uh, but now, uh, you want to make sure that there's, um, beyond reasonable doubt. You want to make sure that you know, uh, that this person was guilty. So in spite of how things ended with the original mankind, which was destroyed by the flood, God is still encouraging to continuing the continuing of mankind to populate and flourish. So he ends it with the same as verse one in verse seven, he says, and you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. So there are other um, religions and even historical accounts of the flood. And um, many of those accounts are very similar, but many of them have some kind of way of like preventing mankind from flourishing, especially there's, um, there's reference to a Babylonian account of the flood. And in that, they, uh, that story is like, and God prevented them from having more kids or something like that. And, um, whereas this one, God is saying, be fruitful and multiply, continue to replenish the earth. Um, so let's take a look now in verse eight. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, behold, 
I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So we'll pause there for just a second. So here, there's a lot of repetition, a lot of mentions of, here's my covenant, here's my covenant, here's my covenant, uh, here's the sign, here's the sign, here's the sign. So there's a lot of repetition here, but basically God is making a promise, which is a covenant um, that's not dependent on man responding to him. This is simply God making a promise that regardless of mankind's actions, he will not do this again. So he's saying, I will never uh, destroy the world by means of a flood again. So some people say, well, we still get floods, but this is saying a worldwide flood. Um, he won't destroy the earth by those means again. And he leaves a sign as a, as a reminder, which is a really cool thing. You know, when you look in the Old Testament, especially, they used to set up reminders of, of something that God had done for them. Sometimes it was like a pillar of stones, uh, just different things that would remind them. And this is God's reminder for us and his promise. And that's the rainbow in the sky. And just when you look at it, it's a reminder of this. That's when it first began. And I can only imagine the, uh, Noah and his family seeing that for the first time. It was probably the best rainbow ever. You know, like this is the first one given by God and, and it just had to be magnificent. And, and he's saying, when you see that, remember my promise to you, because I'm going to remember it is what God says. So, uh, and then this is fitting since the rainbow appears typically right after a rain or when there's, I looked it up, it says when there are raindrops nearby and you're looking at it from a certain angle that's when you see a, a rainbow but it's fitting since right after the flood that's when the rainbow comes and now you know to this day when a rain has come and there are certain circumstances that's when we see the rainbow so it's a beautiful sign of God's promise and it goes on in verse 18 and 19 uh, just a quick the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these, the, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So why include these verses? Um, yes, we get that the whole earth would be populated from these three guys. Duh. Like, you know, like, did you even need to put that in there? But here we get a glimpse that from Ham would come the nation of Canaan. And this is going to be important. So you have to remember the author of the first five books is Moses, and Moses is probably going to be reading this to the Israelites as they're getting ready to take over the land of Canaan. So, so this is really important that, that they establish this very reason that why they're entitled to the land of Canaan, why they're going into the land of Canaan, why they're going to be at war with the people of the land of Canaan in the first place. And we're going to get to that in a second. So I, I believe that this is the very reason why that was in this passage in the first place. Um, so then verse 20, Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward 
and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So a little bit of a weird story here, a little bit of an odd twist. Uh, notice a parallel between Adam and Noah. Both were, you know, Adam had, had perfection. Noah was one of only two people called uh, righteous that walked with God. And Adam was great until he ate. Noah was great until he drank. So uh, some similar things that happened with both of them. Uh, some believe that the fermenting of grapes and the effects of that in wine is an after effect of the flood. I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't tell you if that has any legitimacy. I'm just telling you what some people believe. We do know that he consumed too much. That was beyond his control and it left him exposed in his tent as he was passed out. So that's the scene, uh, Noah's naked in his tent, drunk, all right? Uh, then Ham walks in. Now, we, we're not given the inner thoughts or an even tone of Ham. We can only speculate. My this is Ron Foster's theory, okay? My theory is, is that Ham walked in, saw his 600-year-old dad laying there naked and drunk and thought it was funny, and then he went to tell his brothers to kind of make fun of his dad. Yo, guys, dad's in there, like, knocked out, and he's totally naked. It's so funny. Come watch. Like, that's, that's what I'm picturing. But uh, Shem and Japheth are not, like, they're not going to take part of the making fun of their father. This is a huge sign of disrespect, especially in that culture of honoring your father and mother. And this would be a dishonor to like make fun of him to your other brother. So uh, Shem and Japheth show great respect by walking, walking in backwards. They put it like they're walking side by side and they put a covering between the two of them. They walk in backwards and they lay it over their dad's. Uh, body basically without looking at him so they show great respect to their dad throughout this and then when dad wakes up I'm sure someone told him what happened um, and and there's a big consequence seems like a huge consequence for this uh, Canaan he's saying will be overtaken by the descendants of his brothers and we we're going to see later that the descendants of Shem will eventually be the Israelites. And so that's going to all kind of come about later in Genesis and Exodus. But on the blessing note, Shem is given this place of honor. And other, you know, if we were to continue the line of Shem later, we're, we would see that through the line of Shem will come the descendants that lead to the Messiah. So through the line of Shem, which even in this, in this passage, it says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And, and, and so that almost kind of indicates that Shem is worshiping God, that Shem has a relationship with God. And through his line, the Messiah would end up coming. Uh, so some people have indicated, like, did Ham do something perversive to his dad? Some people have indicated that. Some people have like, did he look on him with lust? Did he have different weird thoughts about him? None of that is indicated. Um, I've kind of just deduced based on the actions and reactions of the brothers and how they acted of what happened in the disrespect. But we're not, we don't have any other evidence to tell us otherwise. So um, if someone says like, oh man, see, that's the first indication of homosexuality in the Bible, they're lying because... We don't have any of that. That's just that he looked and then he told his brothers. That's all we got. So 
Uh, four points to ponder. Number one, God's desire for us is for good. Um, you know, God brought Noah and his sons through this. And then he's, and, and even through all of this, he, he wanted them to continue and to flourish and to bless mankind. So God's, God's desire for you as an image bearer of God is for good. He wants you He wants good things for you. Many people think about God as the person that just sees all the bad things we do and wants to punish us. And that's not the case. God desires good for us. Number two, you have value because you are an image bearer of God. You have not just even value, but you have high value. God places a high value of you because you are made in the image of God. And, and we've talked about this before, even with Genesis chapter 3, when Satan is tempting Adam and Eve in the garden. The reason he did that is because they are image bearers of God, because Satan hates God. Therefore, what is he going to go after? Something that bears the image of God. He despises anything that has to do with God. And you and I represent that. So uh, you have value. And therefore, number three, your enemy has value because they are an image bearer of God. And and I throw that in there because many times when we think about, oh man, I'm an image bearer of God, we think about ourselves and that we have value. But if I have value, that means the person that was rude to me yesterday or the person that cut me off in traffic today or, or whatever, those people have equally high value because they are also image bearers of God. And that should affect how I treat uh, other image bearers of God. If I want them to treat me well because of that, I need to make sure I'm doing the same to them. And then number four, our word may fail, but God's promises stand forever. When God gives a promise, he holds true to it. There's even a verse in the Bible that says um, that, that God can never be unfaithful because he cannot deny himself. God by nature is faithful and, and can't go against himself. He can't go against his word. So even though we might be unfaithful, God cannot be unfaithful. He, and, and we still have living proof of this very promise that he made. And we see it all the time and we get to see the beauty of it. And it's a reminder of God. And it's just a, a cool, awesome uh, thing to, to know that God does for us. Why don't we have a word of prayer and then we will jump into a little bit of discussion. Heavenly Father, Lord, just want to thank you for who you are. Uh, Lord, thank you for this reminder. Um, a reminder that you you seek our good, Lord. You have good thoughts when you see us. You have good uh, intentions towards us. Thank you for this reminder that every human life has value and that we're to treat each human life with dignity and respect and, and, and with as much as we would hope others would treat us with. And Lord, thank you so much as this reminder that you are faithful beyond any measure that we can even imagine of of our own faithfulness. Lord, we fail, we stumble, we go back on our word even to you, but you never do. And Lord, thank you for this constant reminder of your faithfulness when we get to see a rainbow in the sky. That, that we can constantly think and remember you. Lord, be with us this week as we um, seek to, uh, to treat others as image bearers of God and, and how we can give others dignity and respect and that that might lead to a, a conversation that shares the gospel with them. And we'll make sure to give you the praise and the glory for all of that, Lord. We love you so much. In your name I pray. Amen.